everyone, today's video we're talking more about the most common triggers for Meniere's disease attack, and today I'm talking about the menstrual cycle. So let's get into that. Uh, first thing I want to say though is if you are having Meniere's disease attacks that correlate with menstrual cycle, either the end or the beginning or the middle, then your Meniere's is obviously not stable. Now, for those of you that don't know, I'm going to go ahead and review it. Meniere's disease is basically endolymphatic hydrops. To translate that, that means a increased fluid inside the inner ear, uh, and that increased fluid causes increased pressure because it's an enclosed uh, bony space, and so basically the inner ear structures get crushed from the inside out. And so what symptoms does that produce? Well, you can get vertigo, nausea, hearing loss, tinnitus, and Meniere's disease attacks are awful. Uh, I've had a few myself, and I can tell you that the quality of life for people that are having recurrent Meniere's disease attacks is terrible. Now, if you're watching this video, you probably are having Meniere's disease attacks that are correlating and corresponding with different phases in the menstrual cycle. So what I have to tell you is if that's happening, uh, your Meniere's is not stable because you shouldn't be having any changes in your Meniere's condition uh, with the different phases of your menstrual cycle. But if you are, let's talk about today, why would that be? So. Let's talk about the different uh, hormones and why would hormones have any effect on the inner ear at all? Well, there are receptors or little antenna for estrogen in various structures in the inner ear. Uh, they're along this thing called the stria vascularis. I'll show you a picture of that. And that's a, a structure, it's like a wall in the inner ear, and it has everything to do with maintaining the proper electrolyte balance in the fluids in the inner ear. And there's things like perilymph and endolymph. And just to kind of keep it short, uh, changes in estrogen levels can change the electrolyte balance in the inner ear because their receptors are embedded in the stria vascularis. You also find them uh, in the cochlear blood vessels. So I'll show you a picture of that. Uh, this tiny little blood vessel coming off, that's called the labyrinthine artery and that feeds the cochlea and estrogen receptors along that artery, if there are changes in estrogen levels or changes in responsiveness to estrogen, then you can literally change blood flow to the cochlea and that can have uh, results in change in your hearing. Uh, you also can find estrogen, re estrogen receptors in the spiral ganglion, which is where these nerve cells coming out of the cochlea sort of uh, coalesce. Uh, so again, it can have an effect on uh, auditory transmission. And then there are also estrogen receptors along the inner and outer hair cells. So basically, estrogen can have a big influence on your hearing uh, throughout the menstrual cycle. And there's been some studies done on that, which are pretty cool, but we don't have time to go into those. Now, progesterone, okay, also can have a big effect on the inner ear, primarily because progesterone is a diuretic. Uh, one of the more common uh, premenstrual symptoms that women get is fluid retention or bloating, and that's because, as I'll show you in a second, progesterone levels drop, and so you retain fluid. So let, let me just show you these uh, different phases, okay? So there's, I'm going to keep it really simple. The menstrual cycle, we're going to break it down into just two phases, right? There's the follicular phase, which is basically the first half of the cycle, and then there's the luteal phase, which is basically the second half of the cycle. And if you just kind of look as we trace out uh, these hormones here, you know, estrogen is typically going to spike in the follicular phase, and then progesterone is going to be its highest in the luteal phase. And both, though, if you look at both, in the seven, you know, to ten days before the period starts, both of those levels drop off. And that's the area where most women that are having problems with Meniere's attacks and Meniere's symptoms, that's the part of their menstrual cycle they're having it because progesterone levels are dropping. And in some women, they drop so quickly that they're basically in a relative deficiency state if you compare the seven or ten days before their period starts to the rest of their cycle. And that big discrepancy can cause fluid retention, okay? And that can be enough fluid retention that if you have a fragile, unstable Meniere's ear, it can trigger more crushing and then more of the symptoms like the vertigo, the nausea, the tinnitus, uh, the hearing loss, okay? So if you just think about it really, really basically, that's how progesterone and estrogen influence that kind of fluid dynamics. But there is another way, particularly estrogen. Uh, estrogen uh, tends to you know, start increasing as you go from day zero to around the middle of the cycle. And right around ovulation is when cytokines start to uh, spike. Now, cytokines are these immune system messengers. We all have them. They're normal. But their levels start to increase and are highest from ovulation to the end of the menstrual cycle. 
And so you may be someone that has an unlucky combination of both, where you've got the progesterone drop, the cytokine spike, and your ear is already unstable, and those, those factors are working together and creating these attacks. Now, again, I mentioned unstable, I mentioned fragile ear. What I mean is, is that you must have an underlying problem, usually with the immune system, that's keeping your ear unstable. So that little change, I shouldn't say a little bit, changes in these hormones are enough to kind of push you over the edge and push you over the cliff. Now, one thing that I've seen, and if you've watched my other videos, I've said this a million times, over the last 20 years, almost every single Meniere's patient I've seen that makes it to me, meaning they still have these symptoms, still having recurring problems, they have a problem with their immune system. Now, it can be an inflammatory problem. It could be a, an autoimmune problem. Usually not an autoimmune problem affecting the inner ear directly, but it's a, an autoimmune problem in the other part of the body. And the fallout and the inflammatory side effects of that are what's causing their, their ear to have a problem. Uh, but if you are having problems with your uh, menstrual phase and menstrual cycle affecting your ear, you got an unstable ear and you probably have some kind of underlying inflammatory issue uh, that's doing that. So the kind of takeaway today is, is that if this is happening to you, you need to know you can smooth out these drops. You can kind of chase down the fire and so that these changes don't affect you, but you got to find someone and work with a doctor who knows that this can happen, uh, that knows how to adequately assess your immune system. Now, you guys know that I like to use uh, multiple tissue antibody testing. I like to use uh, lymphocyte immunophenotyping because that is really critical for understanding what is your immune system doing because maybe your immune system is already out of whack and every month when you get this drop in progesterone or every month after ovulation you get this increase in cytokines those factors are enough to push you over the cliff because your immune system's already got you at the edge right so you got to work with someone that understands how to look for that and if they find it how to effectively treat it and the other thing you got to realize when i say phenotype what I really mean by that is what is your immune system doing? And you have your own immunophenotype, just like you have your own fingerprint. So even if you have a diagnosis of Meniere's disease, and even if uh, you fit this description I've given today about you know menstrual cycle phases affecting your ear, you still have your own Meniere's disease, your own immune system underneath that. And so there isn't a cookie cutter approach. There's not a cookbook you can use. Yes, sometimes they'll tell you to put on a low sodium diet. And yes, they'll sometimes give you a diuretic. And yes, sometimes they'll give you uh, beta histine. But if you're watching this, that stuff isn't working, <laughs> right? So, I, so you got to find someone that understands about the immune system and the hormones and how they interact. Someone that can take the time to do that because it takes time. And someone who's going to be a good detective for you, okay? So I hope you found this helpful. And I've got other videos on the triggers. And we'll see you next time. Have a good one.